ANA eLearning Academy is brought to you by CDN Graysheet, a trusted source of rare coin and currency valuations since 1963. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the ANA eLearning Academy. The ANA would like to thank our eLearning partner, Graysheet, for their support of the eLearning program. Today, we have a very rare opportunity. We've got Rod Gillis and Ken Brissett, who will be doing a presentation called Fundamental Grading Theory. Now, all attendees will be muted for this presentation. If you have any questions, you may put them in the chat or Q&A box, and I will read them to our presenters at a couple different spots throughout the presentation. They'll let us know when that is. Um, so we will all be muted, but folks, please sit back, relax, get ready for what I have been waiting for for uh, several weeks now, if not a, uh, at least a month or so. Rod, Ken, whenever you're ready, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, visit with us today. Um, as Sam mentioned, we have a, a, a very rare and special uh, presentation today. Um, Ken Brissett will be uh, a guest instructor. He'll be joining us. And uh, that, that's always a, a highlight for me. I know that uh, every time I have the opportunity to hear Ken speak, I, uh, I learn something new. So, and I'm sure you will, uh, you'll feel the same way. Uh, basically, what we will be doing is I have a PowerPoint presentation that we will start with, and then we're going to break from the PowerPoint presentation uh, uh, and turn it over to Ken at uh, some point. And then Ken will be uh, discussing with you uh, his involvement uh, of uh, grading uh, in advancing grading. And, uh, and then, as Sam had mentioned, we will open up the, uh, open up the floor um, three times to be able to have you ask questions for either uh, Ken or, or I. Uh, so that's basically what we're going to do. Now, the reason that we call this Fundamentals of Grading Theory is because we certainly realize that the best way for you to be able to learn how to grade is to be able to um, have coins in front of you. So I changed this around a little bit so that we're talking about the theory. And what we'll be spending time on today is we'll be looking at the history behind grading, how it developed. We'll be taking a look at some tips that you can use when you are working uh, with coins and learning how to grade. So that's what I have planned for you today. All right, and with that, we'll get started. So uh, here's our roadmap. We have a welcome and introductions. We're going to define grading. We'll take a look at the evolution of coin grading, the history of numismatic certification. And by that, I mean the, uh, the third party grading companies. We'll be taking a look at how to examine a coin. Uh, we'll talk about the first points of wear, and we'll also talk about focal points. Let's start off by taking a look at some grading myths. First grading myth, grades never change. Um, that's not true. And hopefully Ken will be able to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Grades evolve and change all of the time. Um, I have seen coins that uh, go up in grade. Uh, something could have happened to a particular coin and it may reduce the grade. Uh, the only problem that I have is when I see uh, coins that were previously graded as um, uh, with wear cross over into the world of, of mid state. Uh, and I have seen that, uh, especially with coins of very high value. Uh, another grading myth, only professionals can grade coins. Well, that's not true. And as a matter of fact, the whole reason that you're here spending time with us today is to disprove that myth. Um, I personally believe that everyone uh, has enough talent to, uh, with some hard work to be able to grade coins that are suitable for their collection. And, and I, that's very important. As a matter of fact, I would tell you that I don't think that um, uh, 
if you don't learn at least on a rudimentary level how to grade, that you're not experiencing everything that numismatics has to offer. Another grading myth, a grade is either right or wrong. Um, you could have two people who are very knowledgeable in grading and they may have a different opinion on a particular grade. Now, if they're one point away, uh, that's absolutely no problem. If one person says, well, a coin is graded good and the other says it's graded in mint state, well, then there is a problem. But I think what you're gonna find is that many people when uh, experienced graders are able to look at a coin and come to a very close agreement as to uh, a particular grade. But if they're one point away, no one is uh, right or wrong. And that leads me to the next myth. Uh, professional graders always agree. That's not true as well. Again, um, uh, people can uh, be a, a point or even two points away and uh, they may have very good reasons for their particular grade and that's okay. And if the coin is in a mint state holder, it cannot have any wear. I think that you're gonna find when you take a look at uh, certain coins, uh, very valuable coins, very valuable gold coins, for example, you will run across uh, examples of being able to see obvious wear, but put in a mint state holder. That does happen. It's important to understand that grading is an art and not a science. As a matter of fact, I would suggest to you that grading is more art than science. Grading is very subjective. Um, we do have parameters and we need to hold close to them. But with that being said, it really is subjective. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about um, uh, the history of grading and what it is. Uh, grading is really a shorthand communication. It's a language all of its own. Uh, the language describes coins in sufficient detail. It describes a state of preservation. Uh, it has developed to become a common language, although it wasn't always that way. And we'll spend time talking about that. It uh, establishes a value range for sight unseen trades. Uh, there was, over time, and Ken will be speaking about this, there were alternatives to uh, actual uh, photographs. There were drawings, pressings, and such. And so uh, grading has developed over time. I want you to um, take a second, and I want you to look at the obverse and reverse of this coin carefully. And I want you to imagine for a moment that you are, uh, this is before uh, photography existed. And what I want you to do is imagine that you are going to try and uh, explain or describe the grade of this coin to someone who is interested in buying it from you. So take a minute, look at this coin carefully and think about how you would describe this coin before images existed. Well, um, if you were trying to explain this to a potential buyer, that coin, it might look something like this. It's an 1870 Carson City, United States, seated Liberty half dollar. And you might say an example that has been lightly circulated with a touch of wear on the coin's high points. The piece has a moderate amount of scattered marks throughout the fields on both obverse and reverse. A few minor rim bumps are visible upon close examination. Liberty is bold and complete on the shield. The centers of the stars are visible. The detail of Liberty's gown is nearly complete. The eagle shield and feathers are complete with just a minor amount of wear along the neck and wingtips. The talons are nearly complete with just a small amount of wear. 
the coin has a modest amount of luster remaining accented with blue highlights. So if we look at it again, I think that you would find that that description that I just read is fairly accurate. The problem is that if there's so much information there, it's hard to comprehend, to take it all in and figure out exactly what you believe the coin looks like. How have we solved that problem over time? Well, today, we would call it an AU-58. And by calling it an AU-58, we would have a really good idea of that, what that coin probably appears like. Here are some uh, terms that have been used over time before grading was standardized. A tad circulated. Good for the piece. And my favorite was a proof now uncirculated. Folks, if uh, you can get anything from me during this presentation, uh, that's one. Uh, that, that, that sentence or that fragment doesn't make any sense. Was a proof now uncirculated? And the reason is, is because a proof is not a grade. A, the term proof describes a method of manufacturing. So what that means is, is that since a proof is not a grade, it can't turn from one to now uncirculated. As a matter of fact, here's how it works. Suppose we took a proof coin and we put it in the middle of the road and we sat there and watched trucks and cars run over it all day long. And at the end of the day, we picked that coin up. Obviously, it's probably damaged and it's certainly uh, not uncirculated, but it is still a proof. Once a proof coin has been created, it is always a proof, irregardless of its condition. Now, once it is no longer uncirculated, we have a term for that. We call it an impaired proof, and that's what it is. So that's that sentence that we described, was a proof now uncirculated, really does not make any sense. Uh, sight unseen purchases were risky. Collectors learned multiple different languages because there were no standards. And collectors had to learn how individual dealers graded their coins. And of course, you can imagine, dealers often um, downplayed the grade when they were buying and upgraded when they planned to sell. Of course, not only dealers do that, but we all tend to do that. Early attempts. So the first call for standards for U.S. coins occurred in 1892. In the February issue of the Numismatist by Joseph Hooper, he described proof and uncirculated only, extremely fine, very fine, fine, very good, good, very fair, fair, poor, and very poor. Now I have a hard time figuring out what the difference would be between a coin that is poor and very poor. That's tough. A New York Times article appeared in 1904 titled, What Gives Old Coins Value? And it was said that the principal reason for a large premium on a coin is its scarcity. And that's true. The mintage of a coin certainly has a role to play. The next thing in importance to the issue of a coin is its condition. And upon this really rests the value of a coin. Well, committees were formed with the idea of coming up with a standardization. And in 1907, at the ANA Columbus Convention, standards were proposed by Hallen Wood. And he basically came up with the idea of uncirculated, very fine, fine, very good, good, fair, and poor. And he published this in the ANA 1910 yearbook. The first numerical system appeared in 1937 by Alfred Reschke. And uh, what he did is he used a 100-point system, uh, basically, where he uh, grades uncirculated coins between 96 and 100, excellent 91 to 95, superior 86 to 90, 
and so on. And you can see that he finished with poor being between 66 and 70 points. Um, the changing of standards, grain inflation. You know, a lot of people believe that uh, grain inflation is, is fairly new. But that's not the case. Uh, grain inflation was raised as an issue in 1946 by Otto Odenhund. And he, uh, the written descriptions are variable and changing. A series of actual coins in various grades uh, by a central authority can change. And what used to be fine is now very fine, et cetera. And again, uh, I can tell you that I have seen that happen. Um, I have seen uh, uh, particularly valuable coins uh, be subjected to great inflation and, and go up. And you'll learn why that is the case a little bit later in the presentation. Major advances in grading. Um, a Guide to the Grading of United States Coins, published in 1958 uh, by Brown and Dunn, the first standard work on grading all U.S. coins. All were written descriptions. It was revised in 1961. Photos were added for each type, no photos for grades, and line drawings added by 1964. Uh, the new Brown and Dunn system, which was published in 1969, an early attempt at degrees within a grade and coding a coin's attributes. So, for example, you could have a 1911 Liberty Nickel, and it would be graded FC 1417-9R4. What that means is a coin in fine condition, F, but with the obverse, a normal fine, and the reverse a bit more worn, C, with normal patina, 14, several die cracks, 17, and a rim nick, 9, on the reverse, R, at 4 o'clock, uh, Roman numeral 4. Can you imagine having that conversation with someone um, and, and debating whether that grade is accurate or not? Well, someone who knows the Brown and Dunn system and uh, is able to talk about that is here with us today. And that is Ken Brissett. And uh, Ken is going to be able to speak with us. Uh, of course, he can speak about anything he wants, but um, he's going to talk with us about sort of his involvement uh, in the, uh, the history and the development of a standardization of grades. And uh, what is very special, at least in my mind, is that he's able to talk about um, his involvement with Brown and Dunn. Uh, before Ken does that, Sam, I'd like for you to, uh, if you would be so kind, is to just remind people of how they might want to view their screen. Certainly. Thank you, Rod. Uh, folks, uh, to make it a little easier, uh, once uh, Rod, uh, um, well, actually, you may want to go into a gallery view at this point, but Rod, if uh, you're going to be sharing screen, uh, it may not, uh, th it, well, it, it really depends on uh, whatever view is easiest uh, for the uh participants but yeah gallery view may work out better for you guys uh so just uh pointing that out so ken the floor is yours hold up for a second ken your audio is is very low we need to adjust that okay yeah Ken, we can't really hear you too well just just there is that any better? Much better. Well, thank you. Well, uh, it was this was a great uh, review of things, uh, brought back a lot of memories, and uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, I I must say that I didn't agree with everything, and and that's probably the point of this. Um, everybody has their own individual. Uh, uh, views about grading. And uh, I guess that's, uh, that's an excellent uh, situation because um, grading is really the appreciation of a coin. Um, it's a shorthand, as you say, a shorthand way of describing the coin to someone else. <clears throat> and, um, and, and so in a sense, that's very good because it gives you a chance to uh, probably appreciate your coins much better when you 
look at them that way. The value of a coin, of course, isn't always a monetary value. It has an artistic value and it has a special uh, uh, meaning to people for whatever reasons, because perhaps it was um, given to them as a gift or, or something that they longed for for a long time. So we value coins differently, um, not only for the grade, but for other re sentimental reasons. Now, I like this review, as I say, I think it uh, so far you've covered things in a way that, uh, that probably intrigued most people who have just heard that because uh, maybe they've had these questions in their mind and wondered why their opinions are different than, than those uh, of, uh, of others today. Well, uh, let me just say this, that um, the appreciation of a coin is an individual experience and um, the grade, whatever number or description you want to put on it, uh, varies from time to time and person to person. Um, the actual physical grade of a coin doesn't change unless there's some damage comes to the coin. But um, the view of what a grade should be called changes over the years and changes according to whether you're the owner of the coin, whether you're the seller of the coin, or whether you're just simply trying to describe the coin. And that's why there's so many different opinions and why we have to um, give these things consideration today. Um, let me say this, that um, you summed it up nicely in this presentation. And I think that last slide that you showed uh, called attention to many things that, that are important to people today. My experience goes back to before 1950. So I've been doing this for a long time. And you'd think by now that I knew everything there was to know about grading. <laughs> and, uh, and I can tell you very candidly that I, that I certainly don't. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> I make it a point to sit in on the grading seminars that the ANA presents every year um, at the uh, summer seminars uh, or uh, through some traveling uh, seminars. I like to sit in because I like to see how the market values uh, coins today and how they grade uh, because that does change. It changed. As, uh, as your notations told you, uh, whether you're the owner of the coin or whether you're the seller of the coin, whether you're just trying to describe the coin, um, those, those, those perceptions will uh, probably be individually uh, assessed. My, uh, my early experience, uh, when, I, when I really began seriously studying coins and thinking about coins. Um, that goes back to probably 1946 or earlier. And um, I, I remember thinking um, of a, a particular coin. I remember it today. It was an 1883 um, V-type nickel without the word sense on it. And uh, my, it was in just such nice condition. I was sure that it was a proof and, uh, and, and just so proud of that coin um, because I had never seen anything else quite like it. Um, today, I understand that it was just a very ordinary coin in, uh, in the usual condition, which was probably extremely fine. But you see, I didn't know any better. And um, it took a while for me to, to gain the experience of, of being able to um, put a grade on my own coins. I had to do that very objectively and, and very harshly when I learned that how, how far apart I was in my grade uh, before I had any experience. I gained that experience by looking at many, many coins, by talking with professional coin dealers by talking with other collectors, by studying and uh, reading whatever literature that I could. Um, 
one of the things that I had that was very fortunate back then, uh, because I, I still had in my mind, I wanted to know what a proof coin really was like. I learned that a proof coin, as Rod has told you, was something that was specially manufactured, had nothing to do with, um, with the regular minting process. Uh, it had nothing to do with uh, uncirculated or business strike coins. But uh, uh, now here's where I, where I um, had the advantage over you today. I bought a proof coin right directly from the United States Mint. At that time, they sold individual coins and you could put them together to make a set of a proof, what we call today a proof set. So I bought a dime and it cost 11 cents plus postage. But um, that was a learning experience for me. I could very inexpensively find, have a proof coin right from the United States Mint and learn exactly what a proof coin should look like. Um, I continued on with experiences like that up to the point where around 1948, um, I felt confident enough to even um, begin uh, giving lectures at uh, local coin clubs and uh, teaching other people how to grade coins. So I've been studying them that long, a long, long time. I still um, look to others to see how they are grading so that I can add that to my list of experiences. And, um, and that's why I'm enthusiastic about this presentation today. And we're not gonna, I think we're not going to really teach you or tell you how to grade your coins today, but, but why you should grade them and how you should grade them. And uh, Rod's doing a good job of that. And I think we're gonna continue on. So um, did you have uh, something that you wanted to add to that, Rod, or, or move on? No, I, I completely agree with everything you said. And when you're ready for the images, you just let me know. Well, let's look at um, that image that you have, I think of an early red book uh, showing the grades that were listed in there. Yes, uh, the condition of coins. This is a page from one of the earliest uh, editions of the red book. And in fact, um, uh, the same thing appeared in the um, handbook or the Whitman handbook or blue book of United States coins. At that time, uh, we tried to find the terms that were most widely used and, uh, and accepted in the industry. Um, we did talk about the proofs and uh, then we went on from uncirculated uh, down to fair. Uh, these were terms that were quite standard within uh, the hobby at that time. And that's why they were reproduced uh, in these, in the red book and blue book. Since that time, these terms um, have stood the test of time, so to speak. Uh, people still recognize what these words mean. And that is because they were simplified and they were quite accurate. And it's because um, many people began their interest in uh, serious numismatics by reading the red book and the blue book. Um, I don't mean to say these were the only um, ways that people learned to grade, but this was the beginning of how people um, learned their basic grading. And, and more people, in fact, millions of people learn uh, to grade through these simplified terms. Um, and I think they went on today to um, perhaps um, uh, um, be more specific in these grades and with greater uh, explanation of them, but, but it sticks in their mind. These are basics that I think uh, everyone should know and everyone seems to begin knowing and then works on from there. Um, perhaps you had some other slides here, Rod. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, oh, this is a page from Brown and Dunn. Um, they, 
they sort of used um, these basic terms, but in the first Brown and Dunn book, which was a real first serious attempt at, um, at codifying all of these grades. Like, oh, let's go back to that. I'm sorry. There it is. Yeah, there, there it is. Um, and I realize you probably can't read much of this, but uh, they took these basic grades and then- I don't know why it's, I'm sorry. Let me get, it's going back. <laughs> Just give me one quick second, Ken. All right, let's leave it there for a minute. Uh, <laughs> um, they made verbal, um, descriptions of these various grades. Now you had to do a lot of reading as you went through this book uh, to grade each individual type of a coin. And uh, it was a massive undertaking and a, and a massive amount of, of information. Um, of course, when you, at the end of the day, you began to realize that the grades were very much the same for um, for uh, each of these different types of coins. Um, and, and it meant a lot of reading to get through this thing and try and understand the basics of grading. And without any illustrations, it was kind of a loss. So let's go back to your, uh, your uh, pictures and look at a, how we try to change that. One of the things uh, when I was working for Whitman Publishing, we decided we would uh, print the Brown and Dunn book for them and, and distribute it. Uh, but without any illustrations, we felt people were lost. So I took it upon myself to try and add some illustrations. It was very difficult to get good photographs at that time. And so I decided to go with line drawings. I had a professional artist make a basic uh, line drawing of every different denomination and type of United States coins. Then I um, made many uh, copies of that, like this little in insert shows you here, made many, many of those, like. The two cent piece, I would have um, uh, maybe 10 or more different draw, uh, drawings in front of me and I would begin with white out and I would subtract from the drawing every little part that wore away. I had to examine many coins to figure that out. But, you know, I quickly learned that the high point, what the high points were on these coins and was able to touch them up with my white out uh, ink and um, make it look as though the coin was was fading away from from uncirculated down to poor condition. Um, it was a arduous task. Uh, it took a lot of research and a lot of um, uh, correspondence with other people to uh, and especially Brown and Dunn uh, to make this happen. But we did it. We got it done. And, and I think it turned out pretty well. Um, Let's see your next slide now. Um, what do we have here? Oh, one of one of the. Um, oh, go go back to the uh, basic uh, book, please. Oh sure. Well, there, there's a photo grade, in its. Uh, oh yeah, we'll we'll talk about photo grade next. Um, one of the things about the Brown and Dunn book, uh, that. Um, that changed, changed our perception of grading. And I'm very proud to say I, it was my doings. They graded coins here, as you can see, from good to uncirculated. Didn't seem right to me, but that's the way everybody was grading their coins from the lowest condition to the highest condition. When I, began um, working on the um, ANA grading standards, I, I changed that. I went from 
the best condition, the highest grade condition down to the lowest grade condition. And the reason I did that was because I did some serious field testing uh, among the employees at uh, the Whitman Publishing. Uh, they have a laboratory testing department. They have consultants. They have all sorts of resources. And I used them. I had people, uh, after I decided on the wording of these coins, I let a group of the people grade the coins from the lowest grade to the highest grade. And another group of people grade from the highest grade down to the lowest grade. I found out that consistently people somehow in their minds were much easier to learn how to grade from the highest grade down to the lowest. And so uh, when I finally published the uh, a and grading standards, that's the way it was. And that's the way it is today. And everybody does it that way and doesn't even think about any, any other way of grading. So I guess it changed the, uh, the industry uh, concept of grading and uh, probably for the better because um, it stayed with us, still there today. Um, uh, probably uh, you want to go back and do a little more of your presentation, Ron, at this oh, point. Actually, we have uh, two other photos if you'd like to talk about them just let me get them well, up for you yes well let's talk about the one that you're pointing to there now the uh photo grade um photo grade was a, was a was a step in between the old brown and dunn and uh and the new concept of grading by uh, actual photographs in the 19s well by in the 1950s and 60s uh Coin photography was improving greatly, and uh, it was difficult to find enough coins in grade to uh, produce a book like this. But um, I give a lot of the credit, all of the credit, to Jim Ruddy to actually going at that, finding sufficient coins, and um, and adding to his book actual photographs of coins rather than line drawings. Line drawings were in the first edition of the um, A and A grading standards. They were in the Brown and Dunn book. Uh, people got used to grading with uh, with these simplified um, line drawings with with my whiteout, and um, I'm awful glad that we were able to switch to photographs of coins. The problem with photographing coins is not just finding coins, but finding coins that are in grade on both sides. It just rarely happens. Um, it's almost um, as though you have to have two coins to show the obverse and reverse of what each grade could be because coins are very apt to be, um, well, several grades, up to two grades different from the uh, obverse to the reverse. And um, and, and I must say that we, we've had to cheat a little bit on photograde and on the current um, grade, ANA grading standards books. We can't always use the same coin to show obverse and reverse because they're just totally different and wouldn't stand up to, um, to word descriptions. And people just don't seem to like to grade coins the way they should. <laughs> uh, by describing both obverse and reverse. Today, we just use um, a grade where, that kind of, a numerical grade that kind of indicates in between uh, uh, one, the, the, the two grades that are on a coin. I guess you call that um, uh, market grading today, um, which is market valuing not market grading, but um, that happens to be my opinion. And um, so anyway, um, that's what I'd like to say at this point. And we have a picture in front of us of the uh, one of the first uh, issues, I, it probably is the first, of the official okay. ANA grading standards. And then we have the most current edition, which is actually in color. 
And uh, Ken, did you want to save that for later or would you like to talk about your involvement with the grading standards now? Oh, we'll talk a little later about that if you wish. Okay, that's, that's uh, completely up to you. Sure, we'll, we'll save that. I think you have more of your presentation, don't you, at this point? I, I certainly can and, and do. Sure. Um, but before we get to that, Sam, did you want to open it up for some initial questions? Yeah, well, let's see. We've had a couple come through the Q&A so far. We could uh, handle a couple right now if you want and then uh, get back to it. Sure. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, first person uh, here asked, uh, uh, is there any wrong way to store a coin that would affect its preservation? I know uh, the answer. I'll let you gentlemen handle that one, though. So any wrong way to store a coin that would affect its preservation. I'm not sure if that's uh, where we were going with this. That's more of a coin preservation than grading uh, per se, but not sure if that's something you wanted to address. Well, so I I'll start off and Ken, please feel free to chime in um, at any time. Uh, I, I would say that there are two things come to mind for me. And that is that in storing coins, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's really a, a personal thing, depending on whether you want to store, how to store your coins. In other words, um, in the way that you want to present them. So you can store your coins individually, uh, which a lot of people do, or you can store your coins sort of together um, in an album form. And, and there are pluses and minuses for each. The two things that I would say that you really need to be careful is, um, and, and it's important to understand that in storing coins, you can spend a little bit of money or you can spend a whole lot of money in, in how to store them. And it's, you can use um, methods that are not expensive to store coins that is fairly effective. So it's not necessarily how much you want to spend that uh, will explain uh, how well you've stored your coins. I will say that one of the uh, lesser, in terms of expense, ways is by using two by two cardboard holders. And if you do use two by two cardboard holders, um, you want to be careful of two things. Number one is you don't want to jam the uh, um, holders next to one another once you've inserted coins in them. Uh, and it's all because of the staples. The staples can actually, in high humidity areas, um, rust and the rust can leach onto the uh, holder it's jammed next to and affect the, the coin that way. And of course, the other thing that you really need to be careful of is when you, when you take a coin out of a two by two holder, that has been stapled, if you don't do it carefully, you can very well scratch the coin. So that's something that you want to always be mindful of when uh, taking it out of a two by two holder. And the other oh, thing I will say is if you want to, um, there, the type of flips, um, there is a, a, a chemical that has been added to some of the flips uh, called PVC or polyvinyl chloride. And the, the mint actually used poly or used polyvinyl chloride at one time. Um, and the whole idea was that the flips tended to be very brittle and polyvinyl chloride was added to make the flips more supple, which was a, a, a good idea in theory. The problem was that people didn't know that polyvinyl, polyvinyl chloride or PVC can break down. And if it breaks down, uh, it can attack your coins. And we see this, especially with copper coins, where if a coin, a copper coin has been in a, uh, um, a flip that was impregnated with PVC, uh, there's a possibility that you'll get this green goo on your coin that will actually attack the, uh, the relief of the coin and it becomes a real mess. Now, uh, does that mean that if you insert a coin in a polyvinyl chloride uh, holder that it's immediately gonna change? No, it's, it's a very long process, uh, but it does happen and you need to be mindful of that. And because that um, 
it doesn't change immediately. That's why uh, PVC holders are still available uh, because if you're using them for short-term storage, you're probably gonna be fine. In other words, if you put a copper coin in a PVC holder and you're holding it in there for six months, you're, you're gonna be fine. Uh, but if you plan on holding it in there for years, you're really tempting the fates. So those are two examples that, that I can relate to that I'm mindful in terms of storing your coin. Uh, Ken, did you have anything that you well, wanted to add to yes, that? Yes, there's another consideration. And uh, I would say this, that um, if you live in a, in a seacoast area, and, and particularly Florida, um, you have to be very mindful of the thought that, uh, that the atmosphere is going to affect your coins if they're not properly stored. Um, I, it's, it's nice today that we have um, slabbing uh, because the coins are somewhat protected by that. But um, it's, it's very, uh, coins are very susceptible to the atmosphere, um, atmospheric conditions that, uh, that might cause them to, to tarnish or tone if they are um, a silver uh, or actually uh, uh, corrode if they're uh, copper. And so uh, I, I would suggest that everyone move to uh, Colorado, where, <laughs> where we have a lovely climate here and it's, it's very arid and um, you don't get those, those problems. And, and it would be nice to have everybody living in Colorado. But if you can't do that, uh, be, be mindful of where you, where you might happen to be living um, and the conditions there. Uh, because there are places where the air is polluted or uh, the high humidity or other factors that, um, that can affect your coins. And you have to think about that uh, type of storage. Uh, I would also say that uh, where many people store their most valuable coins in bank vaults. And, uh, and you have to be concerned about that. A new bank freshly built or, or recently built uh, the, the um, concrete walls that, that might uh, protect that vault where you're storing your coins probably don't dry out actually for several years and the moisture can affect your coins. You should always check however they're stored in a vault, uh, check frequently to be sure that nothing is happening, nothing is changing with your coins, uh, frequently watching or using um, uh, humidifiers um, can help, but you, but you have to watch because there are many factors that can, um, that can affect your coins depending on where and how they're stored. I highly recommend this book if we can see it. Uh, it's an A and A publication. Rod can tell you about that because he had, uh, uh, um, a great deal to do with putting it together. But in that book, uh, besides uh, walking you through many of the things that are being brought to your attention today, there's a, there's a good article in there about uh, coin storage and, and the P PVC problem. I think more coins, more paper money has been damaged by uh, uh, PVC contamination than uh, any other factor uh, other than uh, natural conditions. All right. Thank well, you, Ken, for um, thank you, Ken, for uh, bringing the, the book to our attention. Um, Bill Fiva actually had uh, was a major contributor to that book, and so that that um, that that and by the way, that is a book that we give out to our students who take the live class. So if you're uh, fortunate enough to be able to take it in future summer seminars. We encourage you to do that um, so that you can take the class. One really quick thing I wanted to add on to Ken's uh, excellent uh, discussion concerning banks is that um, make sure that if you do put your coins into a, uh, a, a, a bank vault, your, your own um, box, safety deposit box, please do not choose the very bottom one that is next to the floor. And the reason is that if there's carpeting there, oftentimes they will use very caustic uh, chemicals 
to clean the carpets and that can very well leach into your safety deposit box, uh, the fumes and such and cause uh, the damage to your coins. So insist when you're using a safety deposit box that is that it is not the lowest one to the floor. I'm, I'm so glad that Ken brought up the whole idea behind banks. All right, Sam, go ahead. Okay. Um, I had someone else ask, uh, well, he said, first, it's an honor to listen to Mr. Brissett. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. If you have a split grade obverse reverse coin, do you go with the lower grade overall? <laughs> Ken, did you want to, did well, you want to start? Well, That's for you, Ken. Today, I'm not answering that one. Today, everybody seems to be uh, net grading, net grade or market grade. Um, uh, actually, I'm a traditionalist myself. I like to... Uh, to call a coin the way it really is, it has two grades. If it has two grades from obverse to reverse, I, I will describe it that way. But for the convenience of advertising or writing a description, uh, everybody today seems to want to use um, um, numerical grading. And, um, and you, in, in my mind, you just can't do that very, very accurately. Um, I think a coin should be called for what it is uh, by talking about both sides of the coin. Um, however, net grading is what's happening today. Learn to live with it. Um, I, I guess that's about all I can say for it. So what I will add to that, and, and I, I'm a traditionalist too, uh, along with Ken, so I completely agree with what he's talking about, about how both sides have a role to play. Um, if you remember what Ken said earlier about it's very difficult to find a coin that is of the same grade on both the obverse and reverse, that's very astute because that's very true. What has happened is that um, for most coins now, in terms of a grade relating to value, there's a money side. There's just a side where that is the focus, and that's where the value of the coin lies. Let's use a Morgan dollar, for example. So the obverse of the Morgan dollar is the money side of that coin. And when you're looking at uh, coins that have been graded by a third-party grading company, um, the general rule that you will encounter is this, that the non-money side, in this case the reverse, can only hurt but never help the final grade. And you may agree or disagree with the philosophy behind that, okay? And you would be in good company, but that is the fact of the matter. So let me say that again, the non-money side, and in most cases, it is the reverse. You will find that uh, the reverse, uh, the non-money side can uh, never help but uh, can never help but only hurt the final grade. So if you had a, a, a Morgan dollar, and let's say the obverse is a uh, 62 and the reverse is a 64, it's gonna come back as a 62, it, it doesn't matter. Um, and like I said, and, and I would think that Ken would probably agree based on what he said, that that's not, uh, to a traditionalist, that's really not, good or we wouldn't agree with that but the fact of the matter is that's the way it works well it really all depends if you're pricing the piece or if you're mm -hmm. grading the piece right no you're absolutely right all right we'll take one more sam okay yeah we've got uh several that have come in but we can uh, hold off uh sure. later as well um so one last question we can ask right now this is a fun one what series do you find particularly hard to grade <laughs> I'm interested in Ken's answer to this. Uh, me too. <laughs> okay. I'll, uh, I'll tell you, yap stones. <laughs> now I say that in all seriousness, because they are very difficult to grade. And um, they are certainly numismatic. Uh, yap stones um, are valued uh, not on their condition, uh, but on their um, history of, of who owned them and where they came from and, and, uh, and uh, what's happened to them over the years. 
so uh, some of the most valuable yap stones are in the most miserable condition um, because, because of um, what has happened to them over the years. Um, so uh, very, very difficult. Um, probably um, a second to that uh, in the United States coins, I would say um, Liberty Standing Quarters. Hmm. Yeah, I, I constantly have problem with that. <laughs> I I disagree with the grades on on a lot of coins, but but then grading ought to be an individual thing. You grade a coin because you want to uh, uh, record it in your own mind as to what it looks like, and enjoy it. Uh, if you want to price it, then that's a different thing. Uh, you know, there were dealers in the past, and I'll point to um, Richard Picker, a great friend of mine and a, and a great scholar. Uh, he never graded a coin. Uh, he was a dealer, a very successful coin dealer, and there were others. Um, but you, if you ask Richard Picker the grade of a coin that he was showing you, he'd say, well, that, my grade on that is uh, $420. <laughs> and, he, and, uh, and, and yes, that was his grade. It was his price. Um, and um, there are the dealers, even today, some dealers will, will not uh, try to boggle your mind uh, with the grade. They'll just say, well, you know, this, this coin is going to cost you $200. So if you have a Yapstone and you need it <laughs> graded, now you know who to go to. Um, for me, I would say, uh, I would think of two that come to mind. I would say that, um, what is it, the, the half eagle, um, the Indian uh, half eagle with the sort of recessed um, uh, design. Uh, I, I personally find them particularly hard to grade. Um, when, when I was younger, uh, I found uh, buffalo nickels hard to grade, but I've since worked on that very hard. Uh, and had some experts really point out the fine points of doing that. So now I feel very confident in being able to grade uh, Buffalo nickels. The point is that if you find something difficult to grade and you plan on collecting them, that you can have that become a strength, the weakness become a strength. And, and that's very important. The other one, the other series that I find difficult to grade for obvious reasons uh, are the um, classic commemorative series. Uh, because, you know, they all have different uh, designs. And so there are different focal points and points of wear. And so that um, I, uh, you have to know what you're doing with those as well. So those are my two. But it's good to know that if I should be able to someday get a um, Yapstone, I, I know the guy who's going to be able to help me out. Okay, let's continue. So um, as uh, Ken talked a bit about, the uh, photo grade was uh, uh, something that really changed the way that people were able to study grading. Published in 1970 by James Ruddy, um, used his photographs of coins for each grade with brief written descriptions, uh, notes added to individual grades. Um, there were no images or descriptions of mid-state coins like Brown and Dunn. This was widely accepted standard for circulated coins. Then we have the ANA standard, um, which uh, edited by Ken Brissett and Abe Kossoff, published in 1977, detailed introduction and background information, introduced standards for mint state coins, uh, specific written descriptions for obverse and reverse, resurrected line drawings, Photographs appeared in 1987 with the third edition. Color photographs appear in the seventh edition. And Ken, is this a good time that you'd like to speak about the um, well, ANA sure. grading standards? Sure. Um, <clears throat> thankfully, they have become sort of standards, although they've been abused by many. Um, and and um, and, and a lot of grading services um, sometimes claim to use ANA standards, but they really have their own variations on that. But in the early 1970s, late 60s and early 70s, um, the, the grading situation had really gotten out of hand. 
um, the dealers were inventing all sorts of, of crazy terms that they were calling coins, Every, everything from sexy to Godzilla and, um, and, and who knows what. Um, Richard Yeoman, Dick Yeoman, um, had, um, did a survey at one time um, for an article that he was writing about grading. And uh, he surveyed the uh, whole collecting industry as well as he could. And um, he found, I think it was something like 87 different grade terms that were being used. And of course, uh, you couldn't understand them. They didn't make any sense. And um, I'm glad that uh, we did something about that because, because it was just confusing people even more um, than, than, the inabil than their inabilities to grade. You couldn't understand what a dealer was trying to do when he was telling you that a coin was, was superb, superb, superb. So um, a group of dealers and uh, concerned people got together and um, we had some meetings and decided we would try to do something about standardizing the terms for grading. Not necessarily the grades, but the terms that were being used. Um, the ANA had a couple of uh, conferences where we got, gathered together as many uh, knowledgeable and concerned people as possible and, um, and explore the possibilities of making some ANA standards that could be used. Um, as that developed along the line, along the way, um, some of those leaders, Abe Kosoff and um, Harvey Stacks, were, were, were some of the most uh, prominent um, proponents of this, wanting to get the job done. Uh, I, I followed it very carefully and got in on things so that I could get the printing job. Frankly, I was working with uh, uh, a Whitman Publishing Company, Western Publishing, and uh, we wanted the printing job. Uh, it was an obvious thing. Uh, we were printing uh, the Red Book and the Guidebook and other numismatic books, and we wanted uh, to, to publish this book if at all possible. So I was um, one of the principles in making this happen. There came a time when uh, a group of the most concerned people got together and said, we've got to get this done. Uh, who's going to write it? Who's going to make the standards? How are we going to do this? And um, mine was the only hand that went up. <laughs> and that, that wasn't because I was brave or knew more than anybody else. It was because I wanted that printing job. And um, so um, as it turned out, uh, there were really, truly, uh, a, a number of people who were instrumental in making this happen, but it was Abe Kossoff and myself and Harvey who, who really put things together. We said, we're gonna get the job done. We um, personally interviewed people, uh, dealers all over the country to um, get their views about what the grades should be and, um, and how we should grade them. Um, that all came together on my desk where I had it all there and I, and I had to codify it and, and put it together to make sense out of it because you couldn't be grading um, Buffalo nickels one way and Morgan dollars another way or, or gold coins yet another way. Um, but eventually, and through the help of these, uh, these people, we got the job done. We got it all written and ready to go to press. And, and so we did. Now, on the day that the book was, was first came off the press, the very first book off the press came to me at my desk and uh, by my staff and they were so pleased. Here, here's your very first copy of the book. And I looked at it, I opened, cracked it open, looked at the title page, 
they left Abe Kossoff's name off. <laughs> I about had a heart attack. Uh, how could they do that? And um, before I went into cardiac arrest, the crew started laughing. They had printed one book like that just to torment me. <laughs> well, well uh, as it turned out, the rest of the books were all okay. And, um, and we did get the, get the job done and uh, everybody was happy about it, even Abe, uh, who sent me a nice letter later uh, <laughs> um, congratulating all of us for the job well done. That is, a, that's a new story. I love that story. That's great. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that was the beginnings of it. Uh, and since then, um, it's been, um, it's become more sophisticated and, and changed a little bit with the needs of the community. Um, we, we recognize a lot of things now in the uh, ANA grading standards that we didn't um, have to address previously. Uh, it's gone through its changes and I think it's very well done now and, and uh, very, very well accepted um, with that exception that, um, that, that some dealers have um, taken it upon themselves to, uh, to use different terms. Um, I, I'm quite, a, quite perturbed as a matter of fact with the terms today of, of environmental damage and, uh, and, um, and stickered and whatever, whatever modifications that, that they're talking about today, um, I think we're adding more and more um, of these superlative adjectives to the descriptions and almost headed back towards the 1970s where there were way too many descriptions to, uh, to simply boggle everybody's minds and not know what the, the true grades are. So I would, I would caution people, be careful of, uh, of adding too many of these superlatives, too many pluses and minuses and whatever um, before you get back to, the, to the, the muddled mess that we had in the 1970s. Well said, very well said. Uh, so, and that leads us to, uh, very timely, Ken, that leads us to third-party grading standards. So, uh, PCGS, Professional Coin Grading Service, published in 1977 and revised in 2004, um, their grading standards, um, uh, detailed descriptions of grading, circulated, mint state, and proof coins. And Numismatic Guarantee Corporation, NGC, published in 2004, uh, their focus on modern coins, post-1964, and their guide for grading uncirculated and proof coins. Now, um, I want to bring up something that Ken sort of alluded to, and this is very important for you to understand. I would say that both uh, grading organizations originally started out using the ANA grading standards, but over time, they have morphed into their sort of own uh, grading standards. And um, that's important for you to understand because I've had so many people come up to me and say, you know, I sent a coin to NGC or I sent a coin to PCGS and the coin came back and it wasn't the grade I envisioned. So I sent it to the other company and it came back an entirely different grade. How can that be? And that's a really good question. And the answer is because they have morphed into their own grading standards. Now, I'm not going to suggest to you that the, either one is incorrect. Again, we've talked about how grading is subjective, although I will tell you that when we teach the grading class, uh, the live grading class, we use the a strictly use the ANA grading standards as it should be because it's an ANA uh, sponsored class. But anyway, um, the, uh, st the standards from PCGS and NGC are different. And so that means that um, you might come back with a completely different grade if you subjected the same coin to the two standards. And um, uh, there are uh, dealers and astute um, numismatists who know that PCGS grades some coins 
more conservatively than NGC, and NGC grades certain types of coins uh, perhaps more conservatively than PCGS. And so there's this whole idea of people sending certain coins to one grading company. Um, there's, a, there's a method sort of to their madness, depending on um, how they want the coin to come back. Um, I'm not here to suggest that third-party grading uh, companies are, are bad. I'm not here to suggest that at all. I think they serve a very useful purpose. But I think that you need to be mindful in the uh, fact that they do use different grading standards, which uh, again, started out as ANA grading standards and sort of morphed into their own. The Sheldon system. So um, and Ken has alluded to the fact that we have now um, put numbers with grades. How did that begin? Well, it graded with um, Sheldon. Um, and his uh, taking a look at early American cents. He realized that there was a need for a systematic ordering. And um, he wanted to uh, uh, coordinate numbers with grades because he wanted to address the question of a coin's value. And he knew that the, the value rested on the condition, rarity, and market history. And so he wanted to uh, correlate value with condition. And he used, uh, he used um, the track sales of common varieties of, 19, of 1794 cents. Um, and what he did was he decided that an identifiable and unmutilated condition is basal state. That means that a coin that is so worn that it's not been damaged, but it's um, so worn through honest wear that you can only tell what it is. He gave that a condition of one. And he decided at that time, and remember this was in the late 1940s, that the sale price for such a coin was 50 cents. Um, coins that were in fair condition, he gave the number two, bringing twice as much as the basal state, since fair coins at that time sold for about $2 a piece. Um, he used auction and sale average prices, you know, of at that time fair. Uh, the coins, uh, the large cents that he was studying sold for $2, good for four, fine for 12, and about uncirculated for $50. So what he decided was he came up with a formula that the cent value equals its basal value times the condition. And that's how he came up with numbers to associate with the value of coins. Um, originally, the numerical system was not embraced. Um, adjectives allowed for the art of grading. And in the official a a grading standards in 1977, there we came up with um, uh, about good, good, very good, fine, and so on. And numbers were attached to those particular grades. Notice that when we talk about mint state um, and about uncirculated, you know, today we have AU50, AU53, 55, and 58. At that time, uh, in 1977, those numbers were not used. Mint state, um, there were three. There was mint state 60, mint state 65, and mint state 70. As the ANA grading standards developed, more uh, numbers were added. So in 1981, new mint state grades, 63 and 67 were added. And then in the third edition in 1987, um, the idea of about uncirculated AU58 came about. And it was that this time 11 mint state grades were used all the way from 60 to 70. And it was really embraced at this time that there was a relationship between market value and grade. And so today, when we look at ANA grading standards, you see the following. And I'll just let you take a look at that. Uh, you can read them as well as I. Uh, Ken, did you have any comment concerning that? Uh, yes, I could. Um, in uh, 1948, when Sheldon was, uh, was uh, uh, working on it, or even before that, when Sheldon was working on his book on grading, on, uh, on early coppers, um, I was collecting early coppers by dive varieties at that time. 
and um, had a modest collection. But I wanted to learn about grading so that I could uh, better grade, grade my coins. So I actually uh, uh, corresponded and, uh, with, with Sheldon and, and uh, we became acquainted. And um, when he began writing his book, um, and was accumulating pictures for it. I was learning coin photography on my own. I had to do that on my own. There was no such thing back then. And um, so I worked with uh, Sheldon on uh, photographing some of his coins for the book, for his book and for my own satisfaction so that I could learn how to grade uh, coins by the Sheldon system which was a pretty good system actually um, relating uh, the value to um, the number that he was putting on these worked fine for the first month. After that, <laughs> prices changed and, uh, and the system didn't work that way. It did turn out that um, uh, in time that we found the numerical system worked pretty darn well with colonial coins. And, uh, and I thought that that was fi uh, fine to use it for colonial coins, but not for United States coins, uh, you know, our regular min uh, circulating coins. Well, uh, as I said, I, I did photographs for Sheldon. You'll find in his early book uh, a credit. I was given credit for photographing those coins. But I, moreover, uh, the better part of that was that I was learning to grade by his system, by the way he was grading. And I photographed uh, many, many of his coins uh, just so that I would learn how he was grading them and what he was grading. I, I made um, colored slides of them so I would know exactly what he was talking about. And I still have those slides. So I really learned my grading of coppers from him. And I used it for my, uh, the way I graded colonial coins, uh, where, where it worked pretty well. Where it began to fall apart was when industry tried to use it to grade uh, Morgan dollars. I don't think it works well with Morgan dollars. And um, um, so anyway, the rest, the rest was history. But as I was, <laughs> I'll do an aside here. While I was uh, photographing his coins, uh, he was a doctor and he was always busy, but he had Dorothy Pascal, his assistant, bring his collection to me in New Hampshire where I lived and, and I photographed his collection there. Um, it was uh, quite an event because uh, seeing his coins uh, uh, you know, it was just a great numismatic experience for me. And uh, I wanted so much for my son, Philip, to, um, to enjoy this, this with me. <laughs> and poor Philip came down with the measles that very, very time that, that the Pasco came to me with the co collection and, and Philip could never look at the uh, collection because he had to stay in his room with his measles. <laughs> so. So that was my experience in learning grading from, um, from Sheldon himself. Nice. Oops, we've Thanks, lost Ken. something. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Rod uh, may have uh, got disconnected from us for a moment. But um, <laughs> fortunately, though, we do have about two dozen other questions on deck. Uh, yeah. If one, we can... Uh, trying to approach these. Well, you were talking about EACs. Uh, one person asked, uh, what's the best way to grade older coins like large cents? Uh, do you think these grades are often inflated because of their age? Huh. Well, um, I am a great fan of EAC grading. I think they do it right. They know what they're doing. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just, I can't say enough good things about EAC grading. Um, yeah, there was another person uh, who asked, uh, they said, my friends at EAC uh, developed their own grading guide. It seems to be re resisting grade inflation and generally appears to come out about five points below the other uh, third party graders. So, Well, that's a good observation. 
Yep, very well. Let's see. Um, okay, so we answered that one about EACs. Um, well, it is a tricky one. Uh, one person asks, uh, they need help uh, with grading uh, between MS-60 and MS-70. What details stand out to help decipher the differences between these? I feel like in this grade range, it is so difficult. And uh, just a shameless plug real quick for our grading mint state U.S. coins diploma course. Email education at money.org if, uh, if you're interested. I have to agree with you on that. Yeah, that's a really tricky one to, to handle. Uh, let's see. Well, there's a in that in that grade range, really, it's a I. It's often a matter of opinion, and what a person sees, um, and I think it would be very difficult to find a half a dozen people all agreeing on on a one point difference in that in that range. It, it just boggles my mind. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, it's 11 different grades there, too. <laughs> no, there's 11, 11 different prices. <laughs> Precisely. I apologize. Yes, prices. Yeah, that's more like it, yes. Because <laughs> yeah. really, you're only pricing it when you get into that range. Exactly. At that point. Oh, well, here's an interesting question. With advanced scanning and image used by satellites and other technologies, might it not be time to make grading a science by digital description and not a subjective art? Hmm. Well, <laughs> it's hard to, it's a little hard to um, answer a question like that. Yeah. Because exactly. crime collecting is such a personal uh, endeavor. It should, exactly. a person should have fun collecting coins, not get into that kind of, um, mind-boggling situation okay yeah from uh, what i understand we're uh working on uh, trying to get rod back online here so he should be here uh pretty soon but here's an interesting question um i see coins graded with a plus sign as a vf plus for example or um graded uh sometimes with like for example ngc with a star next to it uh i think the star is different than the plus uh that NGC uses, but uh, I wasn't sure if you wanted to take a stab at that one, Kent. Well, I will, um, I'll, I'll tell a story about a very fine and um, ni a nice friend of mine who was a dealer. And um, as a joke, he, he got some of those little stars that the teachers put on your paper if you get an A. And, and he put these little stars on his um, uh, slab coins. Um, just as a joke, not meaning, not saying anything different. That there was the grade, but but he also had a star or two on there. Uh, so people would ask about, well, what's the star mean? Well, no, you know, just put stars on them because I liked them, <laughs> and, and and it was as meaningful as any of the other pluses and stars that you're going to find on those holders. So be cautious of of that. It's a sales gimmick when they when they add pluses. I, in my my personal opinion. Exactly. Okay, huh. I think I'm back. Nice. Yep, we got you there. Hey, he's back. <laughs> we were just uh, going through some of the uh, Q and A there, some of the uh, questions and answers. Oh, that's great. Ken was able to answer most of them, so we're okay with that. Luckily, he knows grading somewhat, so we're okay. <laughs> Been doing it a little bit. So, um, Rod, I wasn't sure. Should we uh, go on with some more questions? Uh, um, wasn't sure. Uh, uh, if you wanted to um, pick are, up are with you the still at, are, So I went back to the PowerPoint presentation. Are you able to see me? Or the, yes. You're able to see the presentation? Uh, no, uh, we don't have you uh, sharing the screen yet. Let me, uh, yeah, hang on one second. I forgot about that. Now that I've, uh, let me uh, get that back here. Give me one moment. Uh, get you back to a uh, sharing screen. Sorry about that. Okay, should be good to go now. Can can you see it? Uh, did you hit a uh, share? I'm not finding share screen now. No. No. You do have a uh, co-host duties now, so it should be a 
but it'll uh, let you do that. I'm trying to push push up the share screen, and it's it's I it's not anywhere to uh, to be found. And I, uh, and your presentation is uh, it's open. My presentation is open. Correct. Strange, yeah, because uh, I should let you do that. Okay. In the in the meantime, um, you want to try? Uh, should we try answering another question? Sure. Okay. All right. We have a one. Per, yeah, just we have a lot of questions coming in on this one. Um, one person asks, uh, "Have you noticed looser grading standards with World Coins when compared to U.S.? Do World Coins have different grading practices?" Reminds me of the term "fleur de coin" for some reason. Okay, good, Brad. Uh, should have a yeah screen share, but um, yeah, there we go. All right, folks, we'll have this back up in uh, just a moment, and uh, should uh, continue on with the presentation in just a minute here. So, all right, if you want, um, yeah, if you hit uh, there. Perfect. Nice job. Yep. Okay. I apologize, everyone, for the technical difficulties. Um, do you want me to start from there? Did you want to answer the, that question, or we could take a shot at that question? Okay. All right. Go yeah, ahead. So, yeah, or, different looser green stands for uh, yeah, world coins. Well, uh, I. It's a different kind of grading, I think, in uh, um, more traditional in in its. Uh, Fewer terms, and um, probably stricter, much stricter than the uh, market grading here in this country today with with United States coins. Um, I think that the um, uh, ancient coin market and um, the uh, foreign markets in general uh, grade their coins. Uh, what I would say, uh, a stricter and more properly than we do in this country. Um, they're, they're not using market values. They're using uh, very objective terms about what the coin looks like, really, really looks like. Nice. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll get back. I think where we left off, um, we were talking about the types of grading. And basically, there are two types. There are technical and market grading. And when we're talking about technical grading, we're talking about it describes a state of preservation. It really is more science than art um, in technical grading. It's a matter of um, there are uh, how many letters of liberty appear on the coin. And if, based on that, it will be this particular grade. Of course, I'm simplifying, but you get the idea. Um, it's relative to the piece as struck. In other words, when we're talking about um, scratches and detractors in the strict sense, that's not supposed to take a, a big toll in terms of technical grading. Um, there's circulated versus mint state coins. And in our class, when we teach the live version, we generally use technical grading standards for circulated coins. Um, it's technical grading is not affected by the marketplace. A um, very fine buffalo nickel is going to stay a very fine buffalo nickel, no matter the rise in price of that particular coin. So we consider it the true grading of a coin. Market grading. Market grading, um, we usually uh, set aside to use for mint state coins, and it describes a state of preservation with modifiers. And here are the modifiers, marks, strike, luster, and eye appeal. Um, the grade is dependent on the marketplace. 
It's the true pricing of a coin and grades can change. Now I've talked to several uh, people who are very important in the hobby and um, Bill Fiva will tell you, for example, that market grading is not grading a coin, it is pricing a coin. Uh, that, and he believes very passionately about that, that that's what it means. Um, he also said something to me that I, I never quite understood, but when he said this to me, it made it crystal clear about eye appeal. You know, eye appeal is a sort of nebulous idea that um, it, it is what you like. And to a certain extent, that is true. What Bill said, and, and this made a lot of sense to me, he says that luster plus strike plus the detractors uh, equal eye appeal. And, and that makes a lot of sense to me. So that's, that's how I came to the conclusion about what eye appeal is. So um, market grading tends to be used with AU up through mint state coins. Uh, we take a look at friction versus wear. Larger diameter coins are allowed more friction. Softer metal coins are allowed more friction. Um, when we look at softness, gold is the softest of the metals that are currently used in making coins, followed by silver, followed by copper, and the hardest of the metals tends to be nickel. Um, older types are allowed more friction. And what we mean by that is coins that were minted long ago uh, tend to are, are allowed more friction. Open collared coins are allowed more friction. And the obverse grade predominates generally. That doesn't happen all the time, but you're gonna find that that's the general um, consensus when you're looking at market grading and market variances. When you're examining a coin, um, you want to uh, think that it's a learned skill. Consistency in examining a coin is the key. You wanna make sure that your hands are clean. You know eating or drinking. Um, you, the, the rule is you can talk about, you can talk about your coin while eating, just don't uh, grade your coin while you're eating. You wanna be comfortable and you want to use the best possible equipment that you can. And, and the piece of advice that I give people all the time, and I think this is so important, is that when you're grading a coin, you want to make sure that you know your series. What do I mean by that? Well, there are certain series where there are uh, coins that are uh, in certain times and from certain mints that they're weakly struck. You need to know that. And the reason that you need to know that is so that you don't mistake a coin that is weakly struck as a coin that's showing signs of wear. So the more you know, about your particular series that you're collecting and attempting to grade, the more you know, the more accurate uh, your grades most likely will be. Um, you wanna get a clear as view of, as possible of the coin. Be aware of damage on the holder. So in other words, if you're having to uh, look at a slabbed coin and you want to grade it on your own, be aware that there may be a scratch on the holder um, and that's not on the coin, okay? Um, if you want to remove a coin from its holder, only do so with permission. Um, the idea is that if you drop a coin, generally you're gonna be asked to buy it. Again, don't talk over a coin, talk about your coin, not over it. And here's a piece of uh, uh, advice or, uh, that I like to give people that really we are numismatic stewards. We never really own coins. We're only fortunate enough to take care of them for a little while. And so as collectors of coins, what our job is, is to enjoy them. And then when they move on to the next person, make sure that they are in uh, uh, the uh, best care that you could have taken for the coin before it moves on. And, th and that is our job. The right tools, um, lighting. Lighting plays a crucial role when you are attempting to grade a coin. There are basically four types of lighting, sunlight, fluorescent, halogen, and incandescent. 
of the four, the type that you want to use is incandescent. That is the best. The one that is really difficult is sunlight. Um, when you attend a coin show, you will notice that generally the hall is made up of fluorescent lighting. And then dealers tend to have incandescent lamps there at their tables. They're there for a reason. Please make sure that when you're examining a coin that you use the incandescent light. Um, can there be a big change by just uh, relying on fluorescent light? Absolutely. Let me tell you a real quick story. We have, a, um, uh, uh, we have something for children who come to coin shows called Treasure Trivia. And we have question sheets that we hand out to the children and they go to predetermined dealers um, and they ask the dealers a question, they find the answer and they record the answer down. And then they win some really nice prizes. We, we try to do that at all a a sanctioned shows. Well, we often have, um, we use different colors for the question sheets. And um, I, one year we were in Denver and the Broncos football team, they, their colors are blue and orange. So we had the question seat sheets orange. And um, when we looked at the question sheets under the fluorescent light, um, it was orange, but barely so. And when you went out into the sunlight with that same sheet, it did not look orange at all. It looked more like a goldenrod color. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because lighting has a big role to play in how a coin will appear to you. And you might use um, fluorescent or halogen or sunlight and looking at a coin. And when you bring it home and put it under an incandescent bulb, it won't look like the same coin at all. And that's how the difference between lighting can affect looking at your coin. So please be very careful about the type of uh, lighting that you're using and we suggest that you use incandescent bulbs magnification um, we suggest using a hastings triplet loop and we always say that you want to use low power that's best for graining which is between five and seven power the higher power loops that are around 10 to 20 um, they tend to be for work that is a little bit more intricate um, for example uh, looking at varieties, um, maybe looking to see if something has been um, a double die, for example, a minor double die. But you don't want to use a very powerful loop for grading a coin. And the problem with using a very powerful loop and grading a coin is what's going to happen is you're going to be too severe on the coin. Five to seven is what you want to use. I also tell people that um, don't use a loop right away when you're attempting to grade a coin. Uh, use your eyesight first, and then you want to deny or confirm your initial eyesight impression by using a loop. Um, so the loop is there to deny or confirm your initial impression. And what you're going to find is that as you become more experienced in grading coins, your initial impression is going to be correct. Okay. When we talk about a Hastings triplet loop, we're not talking about a loop that has three individual lenses. We're talking about a loop that actually has lenses that are brought together to provide, um, to keep from uh, the, your view being distorted, okay? Um, uh, a padded velvet tray is always uh, welcome to use so that you don't drop the coin. If you do and it lands on the tray, it's no big deal. Uh, if you don't have access to a padded velvet tray, a towel is definitely the way to go. You want to hold the coin by its edge. Place the coin 8 to 12 inches under the light source. View the coin without magnification. Um, there are th three sides to a coin, not two. There's the obverse, reverse, and the edge. You'll want to look at the focal points initially. You'll want to rotate and rock the coin to view uh, light reflection. And again, initial impressions are critical. The more experienced you're going to become, the more that you're going to realize that the initial impressions are probably accurate. The loop is only used to determine if there was something that you missed by looking at it with just your regular eyesight. 
um, hold the magnifier and coin correctly. Lot, I've seen many people take a magnifier and then adjust the magnifier till the, uh, the view of the coin uh, comes into focus. And that's the exact opposite. You want to hold the magnifier fairly close to your eye, and then you want to adjust the coin to, so that it comes in focus. Um, a lot of, I see a lot of people shut their, the eye that they're not planning on using, and, and that's not, you wanna keep both eyes open, okay? Um, when, you're look, when you're grading a coin, you'll want to uh, examine the fields, you'll want to examine the devices, you wanna take a look at the rim and edge. A lot of people divide the coin up into quadrants as they're looking. Now, I'm not here to say that you have to do that. That is what some people are trained to do, and they like using that. I don't particularly use that, um, but I'm not saying that you, you shouldn't if you're comfortable with that. Um, you want to change the angle um, to reveal scratches. You change the angle of your coin to reveal scratches. And again, you're putting it under a loop to confirm or refute initial impressions. So here are some parts, here are the parts of a coin. The field. The field is technically any part of the coin that is not um, encumbered with a device. Device. The device is the design of the coin. There is a primary device. There can be secondary devices. There can be tertiary devices. Um, there's the rim. The rim is uh, theoretically the high point of the coin. The idea behind a rim is sort of the guard against unnecessary wear. And the other reason for a rim is to make coins stackable. And then there's the edge, which is the third side of a coin. And very generally, uh, we have three types of edges. There are lettered edges, there are uh, plain edges, and then there are the edges where that you have a, um, uh, the bumps. And uh, those are the three types of edges that we, you, we say. And the technical term for the edges that have a bump are reeded, reeded edges, okay? Um, by the way, just a real quick story. Uh, reeded edges, the uh, idea that um, there's a, 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 an idea that reeded edges are, were developed to help people who are sight impaired. Uh, after all, a uh, cent has a plain edge and yet a dime has a reeded edge and their diameter is very close. Um, and that makes a lot of sense, but that's not the case. Uh, reading, reading was developed um, to prevent people, people from um, shaving off the edges of coins that where their value was tied up in their precious metal content. There were people who would shave the edges off of coins, keep the shavings, and then be able to purchase something with them. Reading was developed to prevent that, was, that from happening. The story behind that, uh, which I find interesting, is that the people who shaved edges off of coins were known as chiselers. So in today's world, when we speak of someone who does something underhanded or wrong, they often use the term chiseler, which came from people who chiseled off the edges of coins. Market grading attributes. Um, so there can be... Uh, there can be slight circulation uh, uh, on a coin, or it can be mint state. Um, marks on the surface. Where are the marks located and how severe are on the marks, are the marks? And that um, deals with market grading. Strike quality and fullness. Um, there are certain coins that were struck fully and they have a higher premium. And then there are coins that were not struck um, as strong, they were weak strikes. Generally, what you're going to find is that with the grading companies, the third-party grading companies, coins that are weakly struck very rarely have a grade of 64 or higher. Now, if we were technically grading a coin, if it was uh, weakly struck, that would not count as a detractor. But when you're market grading, it does. Um, of all the things in terms of importance when you're market grading a coin, I would say that mint luster is, is the most important. Um, a fully lustrous coin is generally going to grade higher than one that is not. And then, of course, we have the eye appeal. 
What types of marks are we talking about when we're talking about surface marks? Well, there are bag marks, roll marks, and friction marks. Those are the type of marks that happen at the mint. And then there are owner-inflicted marks, hairlines through cleaning, album slide marks. That's if you place the coin in an album and you have that um, plastic window that you can slide. Um, if you do that without care, you can the plastic can actually begin to wear on the coin. And flip marks, again, if you're um, removing a coin and you scratch it with the, um, the end of a staple, that's an owner-inflicted mark. Location of these marks are paramount. Let's take a look at uh, this particular coin. This is a, an eagle, uh, Liberty Head Eagle coin. And where would you find the focal points? Uh, and by focal points, I'm talking about the areas of initial wear. Well, there they are. So on the obverse, it's on Liberty's cheek, the date, and uh, in front of Lady Liberty as you're closing next to the rim. On the reverse, it's the, uh, the shield and the denomination. Here's a two cent piece. So where are the focal points on a two cent piece? Well, they're right here. They're on, uh, again, the shield, the horizontal lines on the shield, the date, and in, on the reverse, it's right in the center of the coin, which happens to be where your fingers, if you were spending the coin, most likely will land. And that's the reason that the two cent area is a focal point. Surface marks. So here's a coin, uh, Morgan dollar. And if you look carefully, you can see that there are some, some marks on, the, the, on uh, the Morgan dollar, both on the field and on the primary device of Lady Liberty. Bag marks. Um, bag marks are really a misnomer. Um, when we use the term bag marks, people initially use the term to mean uh, marks where the uh, coins would hit each other in the bag. And, um, and this is not an instance of a bag mark, even though it's termed that. What has happened in this instance is that the uh, a coin uh, has been ejected um, uh, after it has been minted, and it's still warm due to the friction. And another coin has been ejected from the press, and it has hit this coin with its edge, which has uh, caused the reading to um, leave a mark on the coin. Here we can see the location. Notice that this is on the cheek of Lady Liberty. And you know what's interesting about a bag mark like this is if you look at it, your eye just focuses like a laser beam right onto the focal point, which is the cheek for Lady Liberty. What does this mean? Well, it means generally um, in market grading terms, when this coin uh, is being graded, the fact that there is a detractor or a mark in the focal point means that it is probably going to be graded lower. If we were using technical grading standards, because this happened at the mint, that would be immaterial to its technical grading. Notice here, here's another example where it's pretty apparent. Um, it's on her uh, chin. And again, when you look at this coin, you're gonna see that right away. And again, we've moved it to her neck and you can see the reading there. So if we looked at all four coins, remember we talked about how location is so important when you're um, determining a detractor or a scratch on the coin. So if we look at these, you would, I would suggest to you that the lower right hand is the uh, detractor that counts the least. It's not in an obvious area. It's uh, sort of seven o'clock above the two stars. Your eyes do not focus on it right away. And so it's, um, it's something that would not be counted as strongly against. The next one after that would be at the upper left where it is on her neck. Again, you can see that more so than the original one that we just spoke about 
on the bottom right. But again, it's, it's not as quite as bad. And then the upper right, where it is on her chin, okay, and the, the one where the, the detractor is the strongest would be the lower left, where it's right at the focal point on her cheek. Friction on gold. So as we mentioned, gold is a rather soft metal. And uh, on the St. Gaudens, which is a very high relief coin, um, you can have rub or friction very easily. Where do you find it? Right here. On the obverse, you'll find it on uh, Lady Liberty's knee and on her breast. And on the reverse, you'll find it on the eagle's breast. And you'll also find it at the area of the wing. Um, you can also find it on the tips of the wing on the right-hand side, even though I didn't circle that. Friction on silver. Again, silver is a slightly harder metal than gold. Um, so it's going to get a little bit, um, it's going to be graded a little bit more conservatively generally than gold coins are. So in the Morgan dollar, uh, you can see that there has been uh, friction or marks in the field on the left-hand side, on the cheek, the hairline, and the most obvious place on the reverse is right on the eagle's breast and the, uh, the tip of the eagle's wings. Now, um, when we're talking about friction or wear on a coin, um, as opposed to a weakly struck coin, the clue is a change of color. Wear shows up as a change of color on the coin. And so when you're looking for wear on a coin, please keep that in mind. If you see a change in color, that's where you're going to see initial wear. Uh, people have a very difficult time when they're learning to grade about uh, discerning um, uh, wear from a weak, a weak strike. And uh, it will take a lot of work on your part, just experience that will help you learn the difference. But looking for a change of color is one of the uh, determining factors. The other determining factor, and I mentioned this before, is know your series. Know which years are notorious for uh, coins that are weakly struck. Know which mints are notorious for weak strikes. So for example, uh, on Morgan dollars, if you have a Morgan dollar that was struck in New Orleans, there's a really good chance that is weakly struck. You may ask, why is that happening? Why do people, why do the minters in New Orleans, weren't, weren't they any good? What did they do wrong? Well, the idea is that it was very hard and the, the New Orleans mint to get fresh dyes. And so they realized that if they reduce the pressure on the dyes, the dyes would last longer. Therefore, they would um, uh, be able to make more coins with a particular pair of dyes. And that's the reason behind it. Luster. Luster is so important for mint state through AU grades. Uh, however, luster can even be found rarely, but can be found on a few um, very fine pieces. There are several types of luster and it depends on the dye preparation. And it also de decides on the, um, the uh, variety uh, of the dye use. Um, and it's all, uh, luster is all a result of metal flow. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and what I, that's really important. What I'm trying to say is that luster can only be created at the mint and it cannot be created anywhere else. So there's proof like luster. And I don't really like that term. I know what they mean by proof like. Um, I don't like it because uh, I, I, I don't like the idea of, since um, a proof is a method of manufacturing. I'm kind of uneasy with that, but it's okay. Um, there's semi-proof-like, there's frosty, there's satin, and then there's flat luster. Here's how luster is created. When a dye is brought into a minting press and the um, lower dye, the anvil dye, and the upper dye uh, provide pressure, it, they provide a great amount of pressure, so much so that metal actually flows from the center out. And then 
almost instantaneously after the um, the dyes uh, release their pressure, the metal flows back in. This metal flow of going out and then coming back in is what creates luster. And that's why I'm telling you that the only way luster can be created is at the mint, nowhere else. Here's an example of what luster looks like. This is a highly magnified Lincoln scent. And you can see that there seems to be some ridges, um, some mountain tops and valleys. And that's basically what luster is. Um, it's a reflection off of the mountain tops and valleys. What happens is as a coin wears, uh, the valleys, I mean, I'm sorry, the mountains become less pronounced and they fold into the valleys and then luster is lost. Here's something important that you want to know. When people clean coins, in other words, when they dip coins in jewel luster or any solution, they are reducing the uh, mountaintops and uh, they may be able to hide some of the particular problems with the coin. But um, if you dip a coin too many times, you're gonna lose luster entirely because it wears away at the mountaintops of the mountaintops and valleys that create luster. Dye erosion. Dye erosion can certainly affect luster. The more that the dye is worn, um, the less luster generally will appear. This is an interesting uh, example. On the left-hand side, notice how the stars um, are sort of uh, folding up into the uh, the rim of the coin. This is a classic example of a die that is very worn. Okay. So when you see that, when you see the stars doing that, you'll know that you're dealing with a coin with a worn die. Notice on the right hand side, the dates as they are going into the rim. That is another example. This coin is particularly interesting because not only is it worn dies, but it also sees a die clash. Do you see the letters? underneath the neck of Lady Liberty, above the eight and the one, that's from a die clash. So what has happened is that there is an example of a um, time when the dies hit one another because there was no planchet um, in the minting press at the time that the dies were activated. And so when that happens, the dies pick up um, the, uh, the dies pick up the uh, design from the other side of, of the coin. And so that's, and from that point on, as long as the dies are used, then the, you, the die clash will be seen. We get so many people who contact us and, and talk about something like this and say, well, I, I have something unique. And they talk about a die clash. Well, that's not true because uh, unless of course that the die clash happened before the very last coin from a particular pair of dies or minted, which is probably not the case. Um, you'll also see behind Lady Liberty's hair on the right-hand side that it looks like a big scratch, and that's not a scratch. Um, that is uh, uh, relief, uh, and that's from a die crack. So what's important to understand is that the Mint is a manufacturing company. And their product just happens to be coins. And what they try to do is they try to make as many coins as they possibly can as economically as possible. And when the mint was in its infancy, they generally just used dyes until they couldn't use them anymore because it costs so much to make the dyes. Okay, proof like luster. I know that it's kind of difficult to see, but um, this is, you'll notice in the fields, it's supposed to represent uh, highly reflective uh, fields that are common with proof-like uh, coins. So uh, this is not a proof coin. Special preparations and care was not meant for this. However, this is a coin that was minted early along in the life of the dyes. Uh, and, and that's why you have the proof-like luster. Um, you might say to yourself, well, boy, I noticed that there's a loss of hair design and the ear seems to be a little fuzzy. And on the reverse of the coin, the eagle's breast isn't fully defined. And if you said that, you would be correct. And if you look at the mint, uh, you'll see that there's an O there. 
which means it's from New Orleans, which means that it was weakly struck. Again, knowing your series. Frosty luster. So this is luster that appears on a lot of mint state coins. And there's a, a slight little um, degrading of the uh, dyes, but still uh, very attractive coins, uh, a, a nice amount of luster. And what we're trying to show here is the cartwheel effect. You might hear about that. And the cartwheel effect is sort of like the, you'll be able to trace the luster as it goes around the coin as you tip the coin, okay? Satin luster. Satin luster will be found mostly on uh, coins that have low relief. The peace dollar is not nearly as high relief as the design of the Morgan dollar. Hence, you will see satin luster on peace dollars. It's not an inferior luster. It's just different, caused by one of the factors being the design of the coin. Strike quality. Strike quality is important for mint state through AU grades. Um, factors affecting strike quality, striking pressure, die spacing. So in other words, if the dies are a little bit too far apart as they hit the planchet, um, that's going to cause a weak strike. Dies unparallel. You know, the dies need to be uh, perfectly horizontal for all par portions of the die to hit the, um, the planchet with equal pressure. And if they are not, you're going to have a section of the coin that has a strong um, strike quality and then uh, another part that is, looks rather weak. And of course, worn or eroded dies. Um, sometimes fully struck coins appear weakly struck. A great example of that are Lincoln cents that were made in the late 1920s through the early 1930s. The mint just used the dies to create Lincoln cents until they literally fell apart. And so you can have certain coins from that era, Lincoln cents, that you would swear have obvious wear on them when they do not. It's just that they were so weakly struck because the dies were so worn that that's how they appear. Again, here's an example of a weakly struck coin. Now this coin happens to be from Carson City. Uh, this coin is um, completely mint state. There's nowhere at all, um, but you will see that they are, uh, there's a lack of definition on the obverse where the ear is and, and the hair. And you might say, well, why is it that it's weakly struck always in the same place? Well, with this design, the metal in the center has the further, furthest to go. So when it flows, to fill in the cavities that are in the dies, it has to move quite a long way. And if you don't use the proper amount of pressure, the metal is not going to flow in the cavities of the, design, of the die, and therefore it's going to look weakly struck. And that's where I'm showing that to you. Again, this is different from a change of color. Here's a, weak, here's a weakly struck um, buffalo nickel. You can see that the area on the obverse uh, for the Indian, that that area which a uh, fully struck would have lots of definition, it just isn't there. Here's a well struck as comparison uh, buffalo nickel. And I'll go back. There's the weekly struck. And there's the full strike. Hopefully you can see the difference is, is quite, um, there's quite a difference between the two. So there are certain coins where the design has uh, full strike designations. Full, full and split bands on mercury dimes. Full bell lines on Franklin halves. Full head on standing Liberty quarters. Um, full steps on Jefferson Nichols and full torch on Roosevelt dimes. Here's the here are the full uh, split bands on the um, on the Mercury dime. It's right in the center. Uh, the bands on the fossies. Um, I like to tell people that imagine that you're in a boat and you have to sail from one end uh, to the other. 
if there are any impediments that prevent you from sailing from one end to the other, then they are not split bands. Okay? People often ask, well, what about the top bands and the bottom bands? I can assure you that if the center bands are fully split, the bottom and top will be as well. Um, here's a full strike. We're talking about um, Franklin half dollars, the bell lines. Uh, there need to be continuations of the lines going across the bell. If there are not, it's not considered full bell lines. Oh, boy, that didn't come out. Um, so this is this should have been a, an example of the um, Standing Liberty Quarter. There, for Standing Liberty Quarter to be fully struck, there need to be several things. Number one, there needs to be uh, the hairline needs to be filled. Uh, there's an ear hole that needs to be there, and the um, braids uh, need to be there as well for Lady Liberty. Uh, and this is supposed to, and the, the, this photograph was damaged, this is supposed to represent the full torch for the Roosevelt Dimes. I appeal. Most variable attribute. Uh, individual, it's based on individual opinion um, and also market trends. Let me show you what I mean. So uh, here's an IPL example. So this is a coin that would be considered. Um, this is not what I wanted to show you. I'm sorry. Um, let me move on to initial points of wear. Generally, the high points of, on the coin, there can be color change, um, design flattening, wear versus weak strike. And uh, look, by finding initial points of wear, you have to look at a lot of coins. Yeah, this is, the, this is what I wanted to show you earlier. So here you have a 20 cent piece, a double dime. And... Um, you can imagine that uh, you'll see toning on this coin. Now, some people would like toning on this coin. Some people don't care for toning at all on this coin. And so um, you might wonder, what would be the value of this particular coin? Well, the value of that particular coin depends on uh, who likes toning. And if you're in an auction, only two people need to like toning for the value of this coin to go up. Now, when this coin was sold at auction, it actually sold for much more than its original value, estimated value, because there were people who enjoyed toning so much. If there was no one in the audience who liked the toning, it, it would have sold for significantly less. Um, does toning occur in slabs? And the answer is yes. Um, Here's an example of a coin that has tone in the slab. Notice that the label says it is MS63, 100% white. And if you look at, the, look at the coin carefully, you can see the progression of how that coin has toned over time. And, and we know that it has toned while it was in the holder because the label indicates that it was 100% white. If it looked like that, they probably wouldn't have labeled it as such. Okay, so here we see a coin that is AU. Uh, this coin has um, some very light wear. Uh, you can see the discoloration in the fields a little bit. Very pleasing coin, um, a very nice coin, um, but it has just the ever so slight amount of wear. And here are the examples. You can see the hair above the, the, the uh, ear is a slight discoloration um, in the bonnet. On the reverse, you can see slight discolorization, slight discoloration in the fields. Where do we look for um, initial wear on a buffalo nickel? Right here. Personally, when I learned how to grade um, buffalo nickels, I found for me that if I'm looking for initial wear on the obverse, 
that um, right above the eye is the place that I seem to find it easiest. Now, if you talk to Bill Fiva, who has graded probably more Buffalo nickels than anyone alive, uh, he suggests that you, if you're looking for where, as you're grading a Buffalo nickel, that you initially look at the reverse before the obverse. And he talks about the Mesa effect, which is the, the area where the Buffalo's hip is. And uh, uh, you, if you see the indentation there, that helps uh, know that that helps to let you know that the coin is not showing anywhere. If it's flat at that area, um, like a Mesa, then that uh, shows where on the coin. Where would we find initial wear or discoloration on, on the $20 Liberty head? Here. One other place that I look for discoloration is actually in the braids of her hair above the crown. Um, I personally find that an area um, that uh, discoloration is easy for me to find. And on the $20 gold piece, there you'll see on the reverse the colors. Coins generally wear the same. Um, look for diagnostics for a particular grade. Again, that's knowing your series. Certain series are not normal. Um, early coppers, 20 cent pieces, standing Liberty quarters. These are all examples of, because of their design, um, you have to be very careful in knowing the focal points areas. So here's a Morgan dollar that you can see, it's, it's just a beautiful coin. There are very few detractors. There are no, hardly any um, marks to be found. Uh, a little bit maybe behind uh, Lady Liberty. And that's why the coin was graded so highly. Here's one, um, a little lower grade. And only the reason is because of the detractors in the fields. Okay, there's nothing major, just some very small marks in the fields. Here you can see an example of a mint state coin. Um, it still has a lot of luster, but now you can begin to see some detractors, some very light blemishes, some very light scratches, both on Lady Liberty and in the fields. Okay, this is an ugly coin. UGLY, there ain't no alibi, it's an ugly coin. It's completely mint state, but look at the marks uh, on the obverse, on the cheek area, uh, right in front of Lady Liberty. I mean, this is a coin that was hit by the gravel truck. Hence the grade. Uh, okay, here's an EF coin. Notice that um, there is some wear, but many people would find this EF example, and if certainly you saw one that was AU58, they might say it has better eye appeal than the MS60, and you would probably be right. Um, this coin just suffers from uh, very honest wear. Uh, there's nothing wrong with this coin. Um, there aren't uh, really any detractors to speak of, uh, and a lot of people would, wouldn't mind at all having this coin in their collection as opposed to an MS-60. An MS-60 coin is a problem coin. That means that the coin has, um, uh, it's, it's going to be a tough sell. When you're ready to sell an MS-60 coin, you're going to have a difficult time doing it because it will be easier to find mint state examples. This coin um, would not be, I think, nearly as difficult to sell because it just has honest wear. It's a nice looking coin. Here's one, a very fine example. Okay, now we can see a coin that is worn uh, quite extensively. All, all the luster is gone. Um, but again, it just suffers from honest wear. Here's a very good example of a Morgan dollar. You can see now that the wear is starting to encroach on the, um, on the rim of the coin. 
And here's a good coin. Uh, you can see most of the uh, design has now left the coin from where. Uh, and that's what one looks like. Okay. Um, the next step for you, learning never stops. Uh, there's all types of classes that you can take from fundamentals of grading all the way to advanced uh, grading. Use coin shops, the board's floor, auction viewing as your own classrooms where you can learn to grade coins uh, from those examples. Quiz yourself on coins every once in a while. Take a look at a coin without knowing its grade, uh, decide on a grade and then check the grade itself. And also listen to experienced dealers. They can also help you if you're having a particular problem grading a particular series. All right, Sam, what other questions do we have? Okay. So, uh, Rod, if you want to uh, click uh, uh, end share. That yep. Way, uh, it'll yep. Just give me one quick second. I'll have it right done. Sure. Okay. So, yeah, we had some other questions about coin storage, but it's kind of getting us off topic. And uh, we've got about two dozen questions, and we're already about a. I know. Uh, I'm, I apologize. Over. But um, so let's see. Yeah, we did kind of address uh, one person was asking about different grading standards for uh, ancient coins. I think uh, Ken addressed that earlier. Uh, we spoke about how some coins could be struck crudely, but they'd still be considered mint state. So we can kind of skip that. Uh, one person does ask, what does staining or carbon spots or even cleaning uh, do to grading systems? And why are they not described? Um, that's kind of a trickier question. I guess they're trying to figure out how uh, staining and carbon spots, how that affects grading. Did you want to speak about that, Ken? Well, I, th I think it affects the uh, market value. Um, it's just one of those things that uh, can't be controlled um, and it can't, can't be altered or changed or cleaned if they have carbon spots. Um, but, it, but it does affect the eye appeal and generally lowers the, uh, the grade of a coin. Let's see. Um... See, oh, here's a YN from Encino named Walter. Uh, he has a question that says, it seems to me that the overall grading of the two types of US three cent coins has seen a lot of changes, especially in the last 10 years from the grading services and collectors. Any thoughts as to why? Price values have increased too. Yes, uh, the gradings of the uh, three cent nickel and three cent silver uh, has seen a lot of changes, especially in the last ten years. Hmm. Any uh, any thoughts on that, gentlemen? Or? Well, do you think? Go ahead, Ken. I'm sorry. Well, I think uh, I think dealers, especially, uh, become more, more conscious of the grade and grade more more specifically as the value of a coin goes up. In those cases, those the market and demand for those coins has increased, and uh, and therefore, um, grading becomes, I guess, more, more um, of a consideration because you're trying to price it. Uh, I remember buying a two cent coin and early on, uh, I, was, <laughs> uh, I was offered by a dealer um, my choice of two, two cent pieces. One was uh, what today you would call uh, um, a nice uncirculated red unk. And the other one uh, quite, a, probably two grades higher because it was very, very choice. And uh, the difference in price was, uh, I think like a dollar, like one was $1, the other was $2. Uh, and nobody cared much about grading then. Now, when there's a vast uh, uh, difference in pricing between grades, um, then, then we become more specific about the grade. The well, one thing I can say about the trimes the silver three cent pieces is because as far as I know, um, they were the smallest coins that were ever minted um, by the US Mint. And with those, um, they're so thin that one of the considerations for trimes are that they are not bent. A lot of people carry them in their pocket and they would just bend naturally um, over time. 
And so uh, it's interesting about trimes that one of the considerations in grading those coins is whether they are true, meaning whether they are, are, are flat and not bent in, in any shape or form. Huh. Oh, here's a good question. Uh, is there an eighth edition of the ANA grading standards book in the Ooh. works? Not to my knowledge. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, one person asks, uh, does the numerical grading system apply to currency as well? Uh, I guess they mean the Sheldon system, and I think uh, they do use the Sheldon system for uh, uh, the numeric grades of paper. Yes. Um, well, here's an interesting question. Uh, why is G6 and F15 not included in the book uh, uh, in the seventh edition of uh, grading standards? Hmm. G6 and F15 are not included in the grading standard in the seventh edition. Um, maybe they're just not all highlighted, I guess. I'm not sure uh, I'll not answer that one. I'll have to look up the, I'll have to use my book to see, um, to confirm that. And of course, as time goes on more and more, like it, it just well, really is, seems how the market yeah, goes. Intermediate grades have been added over the years. F15 was, not recognized until re quite recently. Although uh, I always felt it was a true grade, uh, I could I could spot a F um, fifteen, but um, those things kind of change over the years. Nice. Oh, interesting question. Uh, how does toning affect the grading of coins? Huh? Uh, I, I can appeal. I can talk about that for a minute. Um, so um, there was a time in the 80s and early 90s, when just toning was really frowned upon. Uh, people liked their coins blazing white, and they, if their coin was toned, they would often dip it to, so that it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't appear to have any toning. Um, as a matter of fact, I contend, and I don't know whether Ken would agree with this or not, but I contend that there are very few Morgan dollars, for example, that have their original skin. They're, they're most Morgan dollars at some point in their life, somewhere along the line, have uh, most likely been dipped. With that being said, um, the, the, it has turned a little bit, and the toning has become a little bit more popular than it was in the 80s and 90s. And uh, I, I had an example, um, and Sam actually can bear this out. Uh, I had a Franklin half dollar that was really nicely toned. And I said to Sam, uh, before I sent it off to one of the grading companies, I said, um, this is a 63 coin, but because of the toning and its attractiveness, it's gonna come back as a 64. And sure enough, it came back as a 64. Now, whether they graded it as a 64 because of what I said, um, that can be open to debate, but I will contend that they graded it a little bit higher. They gave an extra point because of the attractive toning. So what has happened in uh, the grading, or I'm sorry, the numismatic society is that uh, toning has become uh, attractive to uh, the grading companies. And if it's very attractively toned, uh, I contend that they will often bump it up a little bit. Now, the danger in tone coins when you're grading is that it's very important that you learn to look beneath the toning of a coin to see if there is any hidden damage that the toning is hiding. And so when you're learning to grade, please make sure that when you encounter a tone coin that you pay extra special attention to it because you want to make sure that there's no wear or any kind of damage beneath the toning. Uh, Ken, did you want to add anything to that? When we were doing the survey for the first edition of the ANA grading guide and trying to figure out what was proper and how we should define these terms, um, toning was frowned upon. And uh, most people wanted what we call today white coins. And, but we figured if we use that as a standard for uh, the ANA gradings uh, descriptions that uh, everybody would dip their coins. We did not want people to dip their coins. Uh, 
<laughs> so we uh, carefully sidestep that that uh, problem, um, leaving it up to people to depend on their uh, consideration of eye appeal, uh, whether they wanted coins toned or not toned. Toned. Um, that seems to have fluctuated over the years. There was a time when toned coins were frowned upon because we thought that they would deteriorate in time if they were toned, which is nothing but tarnish. And um, so we did not want to encourage dipping. And, um, and, and we realized that some people liked toning and some people didn't way in back in the 70s. Today, I guess um, nicely toned coins bring a pre premium because uh, they've been marketed that way. Um, so again, it's a matter of eye appeal and, um, and, and uh, market demand. Sure. Well, in the interest of time, I think we could uh, really field uh, one more. Um, and I think this is a good one because uh, uh, I know you have a new book coming out, Ken. If uh, you want to speak about that in a moment, that's fine. But a uh, question here for you, Ken says, which edition of the Red Book do you feel is most memorable to you? Oh, my goodness. What a question. Um, well, <laughs> about, about two years back, uh, when I announced my retirement, um, a Whitman put a, um, uh, an image of me on the back of the book. And, and I, was, I was very pleased and proud of that. I didn't know it was gonna happen that way. And uh, when I got the book and saw that, uh, it pleased me very much. And that's, that's a memorable one, I guess. Nice. Uh, as far as talking about my latest uh, book is called um, A Penny Saved. It's uh, really a uh, re uh, retrospective uh, um, story about the beginning of the Blue Book and the Red Book and the life of R.S. Yeoman. Uh, I knew the man very well, worked for him for many, many years, worked with him. Um, and uh, our, our careers were blended for quite a while. So it's my memories of Yeoman and uh, how these books came to be. And uh, I'm very proud of that book. I, I spent the last year working on it. And uh, it's supposed to be um, released uh, sometime next month. So I hope you all look for it. <laughs> Sam, can I, just, can I just close with a, a real quick statement? Um, I, I, I wanna tell everybody what, um, how much fun and how honored I am to have been able to work with Ken um, Ken is uh, unfortunate. A, a, uh, I count him as a very good friend of mine, and uh, he's certainly an icon within the industry. And um, I, I just want to say that it's it's always a, a real pleasure for me to work with Ken, because I always learn something new uh, when I hear him speak. And the the, the uh, stories that he told today, uh, especially about Brown and Dunn, and um, uh, is, is stuff that it was new to me. And, and I find very interesting. And the final thing that I wanna say is that what um, makes Ken so very special is that even though Ken is so advanced in the hobby and knows so much that I've never seen someone come to Ken with a numismatic question with Ken saying, I just don't have time for you or, I can't, or that's not a question I wanna answer. He's always availed himself to everyone. And for me, that, would, that is what makes him a true icon within the industry. Ken Brissett, Bill Fever, they're cut from the same mold. These are people who give back to the hobby on a consistent basis. And uh, I, I just uh, celebrate them because they're so very special. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Well, folks, thank you uh, again to, uh, of course, Ken Brissett, Rod Gillis for a phenomenal educational presentation. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed it and learned a couple things today, I hope. Um, again, we want to thank Graysheet for their partnership with the ANA eLearning Academy. Uh, we hope you will join us for our future webinars. Please check the ANA website, money.org, uh, for more information under the events and webinars heading. Have a wonderful rest of your day and please.